Hello, my name is Daniela. I'm going to be presenting today how this amazing work on stable diffusion works, uh, all the things behind the scene and how we're generating these amazing images that we see on the internet and YouTube everywhere. So to start, I'm going to ask you to think about an animal. I'm going to think about a book. And then I'm going to ask you to think about an activity. I want to think about baking because I like baking. And I'm going to ask all of you to imagine a book baking. I'm pretty sure all of you can do this. You have this imagination of the little book with the paws in the dough playing. It's really cool. Now, if I ask any of you to draw it, who you? I'm pretty sure even if I bring Da Vinci from his thumb and ask him to do it, it's going to take him a couple of minutes to get a good draw that we can understand. But Four months ago, this amazing thing called Stable Diffusion came out, where you can generate a picture of a book baking a cake in less than four milliseconds. Isn't that amazing? Like, this thing is generating an image from a prompt in a couple of milliseconds. And all of us are capable of seeing this cute book cooking. So this presentation is not for me to tell us how cool this application is, how many things we can do with it, but to understand what is happening behind the scene. How can we look under the hood of stable diffusion and start using it for our, our applications? To do so, we need to understand that stable diffusion is formed by three blocks. So we're going to first start with a prompt text that is going to go through a black box model that we don't know what is inside the question and generate an image. The goal of this presentation is for us to understand what's going on in this black box. And for answering that question, we're going to answer that there is three main blocks inside this box. We're going to have a denoiser, an autoencoder, and a condition mechanism. The denoiser, as the name says, takes noise in away from an image. And later, we're going to understand why we want to do that. An autoencoder, as you can imagine, it encodes information. So the autoencoder is going to take something that is in one space, move it to another space that is going to be smaller. And then we're going to use the same thing to come back from one space to another. So it's going to be mapping information from one world to another world. And the condition mechanism is going to be controlling how our outputs look. Without this, we're going to have some randomness in the model. This is going to control like, hey, I want that book baking a cake. I just don't want a cat jumping some over something. So my work today is for you to understand these three blocks and what they do and how they work. So let's start with the denoiser and why do we want to denoise? For that, I'm going to introduce you Ramon the cat. So you can see Ramon here pretty clear. You can see his eye, his paws, pretty cool. If I add a little bit of noise to Ramon, you can still see Ramon. It's hard to look at it, but it's there. But if I keep adding noise, no one can see Ramon. Ramon is gone. So Ramon is there somewhere, but we cannot find it. And if we use the noising techniques, we can come back and find Ramon under that image. So what this is telling us is that under all patterns that are random, there may be a beautiful image that we can recover. We just need to find a way to denoise it. And that's why we want to remove noise of an image, because we want to find the real and beautiful image we have behind it. So for that, we're going to start with a diffusion process where we're going to take Ramon and little by later making it dirty until it's gone. You cannot find Ramon because it's really dirty. And we can use different techniques to remove the noise. There are a lot of techniques in image processing that can remove noise from an image. But what in 2022 and why don't we use a neural network? They are really trendy and they're really good at doing stuff. So we're going to use a unit network to take that image and predict the noise. And you may be thinking, why are we predicting the noise and not the image? Well, images has a distribution that we don't understand. We cannot really see what is going to be the real distribution of an image. But Gaussian noise, we know how Gaussian noise looks. We may have some variations, but it's easier to predict because we understand how it works. So we're going to take that noisy image, the information on the time step we are, and predict the noise. But what I mean, isn't this too much to act for the network? We're asking for to go from a full noise image to the, break the whole noise when I contaminated the image little by little? Wouldn't it be easier if I just ask her to predict the noise and then come back one iteration and recover the noisy image a little bit less noisy? 
Then I take this less noisy image and give it back to the, my unit network. Predict the noise and repeat the process n times. Eventually, I'm going to be predicting the noise for the first iteration. And then when I get the estimate, I'm going to get the estimate of the original image. Then we have Ramon back. Isn't this cool? I took, I took a really dirty image that had no information to our eyes and little by little removed the noise that was on it. So this is how a diffusion model works. What is the problem with this? Because this is amazing. Why is there is limitations to it? Well, if you have an iPhone and you take pictures with that camera, each picture you're taking, if you have the latest iPhone, it has 50 megapixels. That is 50 billion, millions, I'm sorry, 50 millions of pixels in one image. And you are going to pass that through a network that has around 800 parameters over and over again. It's going to be a slow process, trust me. It's going to take some time unless we have really good supercomputers. So how can we use it? How can we adapt diffusion models such in a way that we can apply in, question, in a matter of seconds in our computers? Here is where stable diffusion enters. A stable diffusion is a Latin diffusion model where we take a big image, pass it through a black box, and generate a small representation of this image. This black box can be anything. And you may be thinking, why can we do this? Why is this going to work? Well, the information, the relevant information on an image is contained in a few pixels. There's no need for me to have all these white pixels in the back or all the pixels. I just need to know the borders and I know the color and I will be able to generate the same pix image. So the relevant information is in a couple of pixels. So compression techniques are really useful for representing images with less data. However, why should we use a uh, old compression technique from image processing if we can use a neural network and train it to our purposes so it finds the best representation? And here, if with a variational autoencoder appears in our model, a variational autoencoder is going to take our image, pass it through the encoder, and generate a representation in a Latin space. There is a compressed representation of the data. Then, Take this, we can take this representation, pass it through the autoencoder again, and recover our image. So you may understand where I'm going with it. Why to work in this world where everything is big and it's going to take a long time if we can work in this small world and then take outputs and come and go? Isn't that a better approach? So a stable diffusion does precisely that. It trains a variational autoencoder to move from the large scale high resolution image to the Latin space. Then in this Latin space, it's going to proceed in the diffusion manner. So that is going to contaminate the image, pass it through the unit, estimate the noise, and predict the previous image, and repeat that process n times. Eventually, we're going to get an image that looks without noise, but it's really small. This is not our cat, and that's not what we want. We want Ramon. So we're going to take this small compressed image and pass it through the variational autoencoder to recover our full size image. However, so far, I haven't told the network this is Ramon. She's just seen the picture and she say, okay, there is a cat, but she's not learning that there is Ramon. So that is where the condition appears. We're gonna condition how this model works by telling him something about the image. So we're telling him in text, this is Ramon, or we can say a segmentation map where you can see the figure of Ramon. It can be an image, they can be different conditions. The most common application for us is text. It's the one that we're more familiar. So for now, we're going to focus on that. So we're going to take the text and pass it through an encoding and convert it and turn it into a matrix that the network can understand. And why we do this? Well, computers don't speak. The, if we just show her the text, she's not going to understand what's going on. She needs some matrix that she can understand and the network can understand. So that's the purpose of the condition encoder. Take the information that we're giving to the network, turn it into the language of the network, and use it so it understands that we're teaching it. This is from on. The benefit of this model is that the variation autoencoder, the unit, and the condition encoder are trained separately. So we can just focus on training one at a time or and then start using them. That is really cool and it's really efficient. And that allowed us to reuse the variational autoencoder and the condition encoder for different applications. So how do we generate an image? How are we doing this process of generating an image? 
we're going to take a user input. In this case, I want the network to generate a baking a cake, and the network is going to generate a random initialization. Then it's going to denote this random initialization using this condition and generate an image. Note that there is some randomness in this process. So if I run this again, I'm going to generate a new pattern, and my output is going to look differently. So this is why when we run different iterations of this over and over again, we're always going to obtain something different because this pattern is not, never going to be the same. But in reality, we also need to understand what noise is coming from the condition and what noise is coming for our process of the denoising. So what we're going to do is generate a random pattern of noise in our latent space. We're going to pass it through the attention unit and the unit without the condition and with the condition. Then with that, we're going to combine into a single pattern of noise. So we're going to sum and restrict such in a way that we get the real noise that is what is coming from the condition. And estimate our image at T0 at the previous step, I'm sorry, and update our input and repeat this over and over again until we get our previous iteration, our estimation, and pass it through the decoder and get our put. So now we understand how we're generating these images. But so far, there's still black boxes that we have a red box that is encoding our data, a blue box that is taking our noisy image and identifying the noise, and a green box that is taking the information we're giving from the outside and converting it into the language of the network. So my purpose on this presentation is that you understand what each of these blocks does and how they are formed. Now we're going to start in probably what is one of the most relevant part of this process, that is the unit, that is removing the noise and what is generating our good images. So a unit is a neural network that looks like a U. That's really where the name comes from. It looks like a U, and it's going to be formed by layers of convolution and activation functions, downsampling operations, and upsampling operation. It's going to take an image and reduce the number of, of its size and increase the number of channels. That is going to increase the features. It is really peculiar that it has escape connections. These connections are going to concatenate the output of a layer into the input of the next layer that is connected to. This is going to allow the network to reuse some features. It's going to take some features that is learning in here and reuse it in the future. The network is formed by three main parts. A contracting layer, a contracting block, I'm sorry, that is going to start reducing the size of the image and start increasing the features. It's going to learn the context of the image. Then, a bottleneck that stops decreasing the size but it keeps capturing the context of the image. And finally, an expansive layer that is going to take our features and it's going to start increasing it such in a way that we can localize things on the image by using the features that we learned in the past. This is good for the noise because of this process where it's capturing context. This is allowing us to identify the noise in the image. Um, however, this is not the model they use in latent diffusion models. They modify it a little bit such in a way that is better for our application. So first, the previous unit didn't contain the time step nor the condition embedding. So they need to make this an input to the network. Then there is a problem of where are they going to enter? So they're going to modify each of these blue box and transform them into from convolutions and ReLU layers to ResNet and spatial transformer layers. Then they're going to add this to the different layers, the information of the time step and the condition. So now. We need to understand how a ResNet and a spatial transformer look. So ResNet is our simpler network. We're going to start with it because it's the nicest one. So we're going to take Ramon and pass it through some layers of normalization, some activation function, and convolution to increase or keep the same number of channels. Then we're going to use a summation to add information about the time step. So we're going to take a vector that is represented our time step, pass it through an activation function in a linear layer that is going to be a multiplication and add it to our information of our cat. Then again, we're going to normalize, pass through an activation function, drop out some values randomly, and use a convolution in two dimensions. We're going to then add it to the input. And in the case that our cat and our output have different number of channels, that is like the third dimension is different, we're going to pass this input through a convolution in this skip connection and give, make it match the number of channels in the output. There are no times that we're going to want to use ResNet without the information on the time step, as is we're going to see in the autoencoder. For that case, we can set this vector to zeros or simply remove this layer. 
suspend the summation from the structure and just pass the network for sequential layers of convolution and activation functions. So now we need to understand what is attention. As human, if you see the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired, and I ask you what does it prefer to, all of you are gonna tell me the animal. But it took us some years to learn that. It wasn't, we didn't come up from the boom and say, oh, that refers to the animal. It took us years to learn. So we need to find another way to teach this to networks. And for that, we define something called the um, attention score. So we're gonna compute an attention score such in a way that the network can understand that it is really related to the animal, capturing how words interact. And how do we implement this? Something that is beautiful about neural network is mostly just matrix multiplication. That's what you really need to understand to understand neural network. So what you're gonna do is take your input, your text, and you're gonna represent it as vectors. You do this through a tokenizer that is assigning each word to a vector in the in a space. So it's just a transform like a dictionary that is gonna move you from one word to a vector. Then you're gonna concatenate these vectors and go through three different layers. Three linear layers that are gonna generate your matrices that are queries, keys, and values. You're gonna do combinations of these matrices to generate this relation between the words in the text. The first matrix multiplication is gonna give you the score that each word gives to each other word. So we're gonna generate these scores. Then we're gonna pass it through a softmax function such in a way that they sum to one. So they can be the weighted sum of the value of each word. So that's gonna give us the vector representation of the attention of each word. But what is more than that? So we just know that it refers to the animal, but it also refers to tire. So we need to let the network understand this. And for that, we're gonna just use several attention heads. One head is gonna pay attention to the animal and the other head is gonna pay attention to tire. Such in the way like our brain can pay attention to two things. So for implementing a multi-head attention that can pay attention to different parts of the sentence, what we use is put several layers of attention in parallel. These layers are not connected between them. Then the output of these layers is concatenated and we use a linear layer to do the weighted sum of this element, generating a final matrix that is gonna contain the information of all layers. So what this is doing is summing this and saying like, hey, the information from the first head is really important, but the second head is not as important. So when we sum this, let's put a small value to it. We don't really care as much about what she's learning. So this is a function of the cross attention to find different parts of the sentence that can be related. But we're not using your sentence and we're doing images. So we need to find a way to take the information from the text or condition and match it to the image. So if you see a headshot crossing the street and I ask you, where is the headshot? You're gonna point here. And I ask you, where's the street? Oh, here it is. So that's really easy for us. But for the network, it's not that easy. We need to find a way to teach it to the network. So what cross attention does is combine information from the condition, in our case, text, with the image, help her identify where is the elements and what it's referring to. And again, what we are going to do is just do matrix multiplication. So we're going to take our image and we're going to reshape it such in a way that instead of having several channels, it just looks like a matrix. We're going to take the columns of this matrix, this really long image, and we're going to concatenate it, and we're going to have several really long columns. With that, we're gonna compute the queries. And then we're gonna use the context embedding to compute the keys and the values. This multiplication here is gonna then capture how the different elements on our context, let's say words, interact with the image. So what is the relationship between the words and the different parts of the image? And then again, we're gonna pass it through a softmax to generate our probability or a score that is between zero and one and sums to one for those the uh, products. And finally, we're going to sum the values and obtain a really, really long matrix. So our goal then is to use this in a multi-head attention such in a way that we can understand how different words interact with different parts of the image. And that's where the spatial transforming that I mentioned at the beginning of the unit works, comes into play. We're going to take several cross-attention heads, put them in parallel, and then we're going to have and output that's really, really long because we have the concatenation of those really, really long matrices. Pass it through a linear layer, such in a way that we can 
sum them and the weighted sum, and normalize it and finally end up with a matrix that has the similar dimensions to the one that entered in the image. So in a way, they can be an input to our dress net in the next layer. So that was the unit. What we did is understand what the spatial transformer and the dress net layer blocks that are gonna be inside these arrows look. The condition embedding is gonna be the same, it's gonna take constant, and it's gonna enter all the spatial transformer you're gonna put in this network. In your time step, it's gonna go through a function that's gonna turn it into a small vector, then the embedding turns the small vector and make it really long and give it as an input to all the ResNet layers in the network. So how deep this network go, how many layers you put from for down sampling and how many up sampling layer varies depending on the application. So the authors play around with those parameters as well as the number of ResNets and convolutions you put per block to uh, adapt it from one application to another. So we finally understood our red, uh, our unit. And so now we know how we're using the noise and how it looks inside this blue box. Now let's take a look to the variational autoencoder. Our variational autoencoder or an encoder is taking an image, projecting into a latent space that is this compressed representation of the image, taking the decoder, applying it to that image in the latent space and making it big again. But a variational autoencoder does not learn these variables itself, but it decides to learn a normal distribution for each of these variables, and it learns the mean and the standard deviation of that distribution. Then it uses a sampling process to generate an image from that distribution that is a small and give it to the decoder to generate a high resolution image. However, if you're familiar to the way we train neural networks, we use backpropagation and this sampling operation blocks the gradient computation. It does not let us uh, compute and update the weights on our training. What they use, the author are really clever. They use the reparametrization trick to remove that block. So they're gonna introduce a random variable epsilon that is gonna be normally distribu distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And then you summation of the mean plus the standard deviation times that epsilon. So the gradient computation through this block can be done easily. And this parameter is not updated. It's just a random parameter that we're adding to our network. So we don't need to update it. So this way we can train the network. Let's take a look to how the encoder and the decoder work and how they look. So the encoders and decoders are formed by ResNet blocks and some attention layers. You're gonna take your image, use some sequential ResNet, where we're not gonna use the time step embedding, so we're gonna remove the summation from the network and use some sampling operations. Then we're gonna repeat this operation over and over again until we arrive to the size of the image we want. We're gonna add some attention layers such that the image can understand what, how different parts of it interact. That is gonna lead us to the uh, two outputs, a uh, matrix that represents the mean and a matrix that represents our standard deviation. Worth mentioning that in general, this encoder does not need to generate a matrix. It can generate a vector. We're using matrices because it preserves some spatial characteristics of images and is really useful for our application. Then the decoder takes a sample from that space using the reparametrization trick and make it high resolution. To do so, it uses two dimensional convolutions, ResNet layers, attention, and upsampling blocks that are ResNet with upsampling. Te uh, techniques, and we increase the size of our image. So the attention on our variational autoencoder looks a little bit different. We're gonna take our image and use three 2D convolution layers to generate our query keys and values. Then we reshape this so we can do matrix multiplication because the output of these convolutions are tensors that have several layers. And then we take compute attention scores, I do the summation of the values, the weighted sum, shape again so we have a matrix that looks like our image that has many layers. And at the end, we're gonna do a skip connection to where we're gonna sum the input to the output. So how do we train the variational autoencoder? We're gonna take our image, pass it to the encoder, generate a, sta a standard deviation and a mean, use the proper matrization trick to generate a Latin matrix decode it and generate get a high resolution image. Then we're gonna compute the elbow loss, that is the evidence lower bound. That is a major, uh, measure of 
an upper band measure of the logarithm of the probability distribution. So how does that look? Uh, love look? It's going to compute the likelihood between the input and the output. If you're familiar with likelihood, that means that we need to make infinite repetitions for different values of epsilon. However, the authors are really clever and they tell us that, that there's no need for that. We can just do one repetition and get the likelihood. And this measure can be, for example, the mean square error. Then the other part of our loss is going to compute the diver called up labor diver divergence between our normal distribution with this mean and standard deviation and the normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This is then computing how different is normal distribution from a normal distribution with zero and one. Now let's think about how we train our unit in a latent diffusion model. We're going to take our cat, Ramon, and pass it through the encoder, project it into our latent space. Then we're going to generate some random noise and contaminate our image. Then we generate our noisy image and give it to the attention unit with the condition that is go, to, go through the condition encoder and get their matrix and the time step information. This is going to generate our noise prediction. And we're going to compute the loss between this prediction and the noise we used to contaminate our image. That loss can be the L2 norm, L1 norm, the mean of L1 norm, the mean of L2 norm. There are different loss. And then we're gonna use that loss to update the weights of the unit through back propagation. So that's how we're gonna train. And this is something that can be do fast thanks to the size of the images where are relatively small. More specifically in the application of stable diffusion, they use a latent space of images of 54 by 64. So now we know how these two blocks work, the attention and the variation allowed to encoder. Let's take a look to the condition encoder. For the condition encoder, a stable diffusion uses the clip encoders. So clip is this neural network that is gonna take some images and it's gonna match it to some text. To do so, it's gonna generate a vector representation of the images using the image encoder and a vector representation of the text using the text encoder. Then it's going to compute the dot product between these vectors and generate a matrix of scores. The one that has the highest score is the one that has the most relation to your image, the text that has the most relation to your image. So ideally, we would like to have a diagonal matrix that has high values in the diagonal and low values in the off diagonal elements. So, what are the encoders these clever people at OpenAI are using? So, they're going to use transformers. So what is a transformer? A transformer is going to be layers of multi-head attention. As we learned in the beginning, it's going to let the, uh, the network to pay attention to different parts of the sentence. Then it's going to add and normalize and use with forward layers that are multi-layer perceptrons. Then we're going to get our output there is information. For sentences, we're going to use a tokenizer that is going to transform each word into a vector. So we can understand because it's numeric. And for images, we're gonna take the image and divide it into small blocks. Then each of these blocks, the columns of each of these blocks are gonna be concatenated such in a way that you get a really, really long vector. Those vectors are gonna be our words in our input and we're gonna remove this tokenizer, tokenizer. So we can enter this to the transformer and generate our final matrix. And how do we train clip? For the training clip, um, we take our images. So we're gonna have N images and then text. And they're going to be organized in such a way that the text in I is equal to it correspond to the image I. We're going to use clip to generate our matrix of scores, and then we're going to compute the probabilities of taking this. Why probabilities? Because probabilities are enough to work for classification. So in this matrix, we're going to have the probability of the image I taking the text I. And then we're going to compute some multi class losses across the matrices. So we're going to compute the loss the cross entropy loss across rows and across columns. So for images and text. Then we're gonna sum these two losses and use back propagation to update the encoders in the in the network. So that's the general application of how the condition the conditioning encoder works. But there is other applications of stable diffusion, such as in painting, where you take an image and want to remove a part of it. To do so, we're gonna use as a condition the segmentation map that is gonna be an image that is all black and it's going to have white pixels in the places we want to remove. 
The encoder we use for this application is the same variational autoencoder that we're using. So we're gonna use the encoder of that variational autoencoder to project the segmentation map into the language of their new net. Then there's semantics land spaces to images. That's gonna be text that is gonna explain the coordinates of the objects and the object we wanna see in the different parts of the image. And then there's image modification. The condition in this case is also going to be text, but the input of our, of our network is gonna be our original image that we're gonna make pretty. So this application is really cool because now we can take the part that all about drug at the beginning baking and making it look pretty with this network. So it's gonna make us artists, all of us. So that's pretty much other application, but it's something really cool we can do with this network that is teach it a new class. So we can download that model that is in there and teach it who is Ramon. And then we can generate images with Ramon and we can even make pictures of Ramon playing with other cats. So it's really cool. But to do that, we need to be aware that if we teach the network just who is Ramon, she's gonna forget about other cats. She's not really smart, sometimes she forgets stuff. So if you teach it who is Ramon, she's gonna forget about the cats. And every time we ask for a cat, we're always gonna see Ramon. To avoid that, the authors recommend to use prior examples, where you're gonna compute the loss of Ramon and for a random cat. And you're gonna describe the random cat as a, a random token cat. And your cat as a Ramon cat. That is what, the way you need to describe the two images. The random token is a word that is not really common in the, in the language. The examples I have seen use a word that is SKS, and that's how to describe this image. Then you're gonna pass both images to the encoder and you're gonna get small representation. Contaminate both images with random noise. Each image gets its own random noise and you get the noisy images. Pass it through the unit, so it's in a way that you can generate the noisy example from a random cat, a Ramon cat. And you're gonna compute your loss for Ramon and your loss for your prior example. Then you're gonna combine this loss and use back propagation. When you do this, it's been found that you can use really few images of Ramon. With 20 images, you're gonna teach this network who is Ramon. And the reason you need this prior example is to avoid something called language drift that is really common in language models in which the network forgets what a class looks like and it updates it just to look like Ramon. So with this technique, you can download that model that is in the new cloud and update it such in a way that it can learn your face, the face of your pet or anything you want it. So you can personalize it to your applications. So to conclude this presentation, I want you to remember that we use a variational autoencoder to move from the high resolution images to a latent space where we can work faster in the unit and that we use the unit to predict the noise in our image because behind that noise, there is a beautiful image that we want to find. And the condition is gonna tell the network how does the image should look, not make it random, it's not just a white canvas, I want something in there. And remember, we use a e-user input to do that conditioning. Thank you. I hope you learned something about the model and you at least know the building blocks. Mm -hmm.